Hello, hi everyone. Welcome back to Wu Can Cook. My name is Wesley, and this is a show where we are slowly cooking our way through all of the food from my childhood. Today, we're diving back into our series dedicated to classic Americanized Chinese cuisine with a look at the Kung Pao Chicken from P.F. Chang's. For those new to the channel in this series, we have been deconstructing classic dishes from Americanized Chinese cuisine, including now just a whole bunch of stuff from P.F. Chang's, then seeing what it might look like when reconstructed through the lens of more traditional wok cooking. Kung Pao Chicken, of course, is not an unfamiliar sight on this channel. Some may recall that we took our very best shot at the Panda Express Kung Pao Chicken last year, as well as our own version done on a 200,000 BTU wok burner a few months back, too. Its concept is not a particularly complicated one. Kung Pao Chicken is essentially a stir-fry featuring a wok-seared piece of chicken and a crispy flash-fried vegetable. As with most stir-fries, the vegetable element can be toyed with a bit to accommodate whatever happens to be in season, but by definition, Kung Pao Chicken must include one element, which of course is a wok-fried peanut. And make no mistake, it's not Kung Pao Chicken without peanuts, so we'll absolutely be touching on exactly how to dry toast a raw peanut for a stir-fry. What is particularly unique about the P.F. Chang's Kung Pao Chicken, however, is that in lieu of the seared and flash-cooked chicken thigh that we more commonly would use in most versions of this dish, today we'll instead be breading our chicken in potato starch, then deep-frying it to crispy, craggly, bite-sized pieces. So this means that we're going to be using my favorite double-breading technique with our chicken to create what is essentially a Japanese chicken karage Kung Pao Chicken, which is very interesting. Okay, so... Let's get into it. Okay, so diving right in, as you might expect, we're gonna start off here with what initially is going to look like a very straightforward Kung Pao chicken before things go just way off track. First up, these are our aromatic veggies for our wok fry coming up. This is four cloves of crushed and minced garlic to start, followed next by one inch or about one tablespoon of fine minced ginger, and the whites of three green onions separated from their leafy greens, then sliced up thinly. Rounding this out, we're taking these reserved greens, slicing them up thinly on a bias, and setting aside for our final finishing garnish. Moving right along, now the Kung Pao Chicken from P.F. Chang's very specifically includes the use of long, bias-cut slices of celery, which in my opinion is just one of the most filler ingredient veggies that you can put into a stir-fry. They honestly just don't really add much flavor or profile to a dish for me, I don't know. But in any case, they are also pretty stable when stored in a vegetable crisper drawer though, so if that's what you've got on hand, then let's do it. We're starting off by snapping our celery stalks in half to reveal these long stringy bits of fiber here. We want to pull as much of this off as possible, otherwise it's going to make your celery chewy and difficult to eat. Then true to form, we're slicing these up on a bias into long pieces, then setting aside while we make the only amendment to this dish's composition today, which is the addition of one half of a sweet white onion, large diced with the root end still attached. I went ahead and added an extra veggie here to complement our celery since, again, it isn't going to taste like very much and is mainly just there to add texture to our stir-fry. Moving right along to our sauce element next, now this is where things are going to start looking a little bit unusual. In a more traditional Kung Pao chicken that features a flash-fried chicken thigh, we would create a bright and savory sauce to add to our stir-fry towards the end of its cook time, then thickened up with a cornstarch slurry, yielding the thick, saucy stir-fry texture that we all know and love. Since we are using a fried chicken though, we're gonna instead need to turn this sauce element into a glaze, more akin to a sweet and savory General Tso's chicken rather than a Kung Pao stir-fry. So, starting things off here first are our savory Kung Pao sauce elements. This is four tablespoons of soy sauce and a single tablespoon of sesame oil to start, followed next by a tablespoon of Shaoxing wine for some brightness, and a tablespoon of oyster sauce for our rich umami qualities. Then next, this is two tablespoons of doubanjiang to give us our heat elements, and if this were a normal Kung Pao stir-fry, we would stop right here. But since we are making a glaze, we're gonna go ahead and include some sugar elements to help our sauce thicken into a sticky glaze texture as we reduce it. So this is two tablespoons each of sweet chili sauce and honey rounding everything out. 
We are going pretty light on the sugar elements here though, because our goal is to achieve a glazed-like texture without substantially adding sweet or sugary flavors to our stir fry so that it still remains a Kung Pao chicken at its core. Moving on to our chicken thigh next, I'm starting off by large dicing two medium chicken thighs, which as always is my preference for the extra fat that it contains. I'm adding this to a mixing bowl, then assembling a fairly simple marinade for our chicken. This is just four tablespoons of soy sauce and a half teaspoon of white pepper going in. We're giving this all a toss to combine, then setting aside to marinate for 30 minutes before diving into our double breading next. Now, what we are essentially doing here is putting together a fried chicken karage, which, for those unfamiliar, is the iconic Japanese popcorn chicken that you've almost certainly come across if you've ever ordered fried chicken in a Japanese restaurant. Chicken karage iconically features a thin breading using potato starch, which has the unique quality of clumping up into interesting ways to create the craggly, crunchy piece of fried chicken that we all know and love. To help us achieve this quality, we're going to do a double breading with our potato starch. So, for our first breading, I'm adding a quarter cup of potato starch straight into my mixing bowl and giving a quick toss to combine. You'll notice that this should immediately yield a fairly sticky, clumpy batter already. Then next, I'm adding another half cup of potato starch to a separate mixing bowl and breading each piece of chicken individually for our second breading, yielding this beautifully craggly breaded chicken. Over on the stove, I have my deep fry station heating up to 350 degrees F. Then I'm adding my chicken in here about 15 to 20 pieces at a time, making sure that our fryer doesn't dip below 325 degrees or so as we cook. We're frying our chicken for 3-4 to four minutes until deeply golden brown, then removing to a dry rack to cool while we move on to our peanuts next. Now, in my opinion, I actually think that this might be the hardest part in making a Kung Pao chicken because it requires a lot of patience. We have our wok here heated up over low heat this time, then I'm adding a quarter cup of raw peanuts along with my dried Tianjin peppers and dry toasting these with constant agitation for about 5 minutes until crispy and aromatic. At this point, you may be tempted to turn up the heat and rush things because for a while it may look like nothing is happening, but be warned that this will almost certainly result in a burnt peanut, so be patient and don't rush this step because no one likes a burnt peanut. Moving right along, up next we're finally diving into our stir fry here. I have my wok heating up as hot as possible, then this is 4 tablespoons of peanut oil going in, and as always, long yao for that nice non-stick surface. Then going in here first are my aromatic veggies. Here's my garlic, ginger, and the whites of my green onions going in for 15 seconds until nice and fragrant. Lately, some folks have been asking how do we make sure that these don't burn since our aromatics are so delicate. This step is all about timing here. We've got about 20 seconds to start agitating that garlic or else it's going to burn on an idle walk. So, mise en place is key here too. Up next, here's my celery and onion going in, which were sautéing for about 2 to 3 minutes until cooked just past their raw stage. Then I'm removing my veggies, turning down my fire to a medium-low heat, adding my glaze mixture plus about a quarter cup of water to keep our sugars from immediately burning, and reducing our glaze for about 5 minutes until a thick and syrupy consistency begins to form. Once our glaze has thickened up and we're thoroughly off track from a more traditional Kung Pao chicken, I'm turning off our heat entirely, then adding everything back to the wok and giving a quick toss to combine. Finally, we're serving this all over rice, finishing with the greens of our green onions, and we're ready to eat. Okay, so I know that I have been saying this for basically the entire video, but I'll say it again. We are wildly off track from what a more traditional Kung Pao chicken should look like at this point, which I think makes this dish incredibly interesting and unique. What we've ended up with here is fundamentally still a Kung Pao chicken in the sense that there is chicken, vegetables, and of course, peanuts. That said, the inclusion of fried chicken and maybe more importantly, the adjustments to our glaze that we've made to accommodate yields for us a completely different dish though, which is honestly more similar to a savory General Tso's chicken or orange chicken. I think our flavor profile stays fairly true to what a Kung Pao chicken should be and keeps our rich and savory notes pretty far forward with our doubanjiang, oyster sauce, and tianjin pepper. I will say that I was a little bit worried about involving the sweet elements that we needed for our glaze, but I think that they are subtle enough that they don't overpower the dish as often happens with things like orange chicken. 
Then to pair with this, our fried chicken is crispy and craggly from our potato starch breading just as we planned, resulting in what I can genuinely say is one of my favorite fried chicken creations that we've come up with in a while, which is saying something because we've done a lot of fried chicken now, y'all. Just like a lot. Okay, so that's it everyone. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you give this one a shot. For those who are new to the channel, this one is part of a larger series that we've been doing that's dedicated to reproducing classic Chinese American dishes, including a whole bunch of stuff from the Panda Express menu. So definitely check out that series next if you haven't yet because there's a lot of these. For the Bay Area locals, the Wu Can Cook Fried Rice Pop-Up is now at Wondrous Brewing in Emeryville every Thursday through Sunday. So come by and say hi then if you can. More about that at wucancook.com slash eats. Also, if you haven't seen it yet, we've got t-shirts. I'm super excited to be partnering with my good friends at Polywog Prints to make these super sweet Wu Can Cook shirts. They're really soft and comfortable, and also there's a picture of me on the back, which is crazy. We're selling these at the Wu Can Cook pop-up, or you can head over to wucancook.com slash shop to grab one from the online store too. As always, like, comment, subscribe, share, be nice internetters, and I'll see you soon.